This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's show is all about an artist who is widely considered to be America's greatest musical poet laureate and visionary, Bob Dylan. He is an artist of transcendent historical importance, both as a cultural hero and an anti-hero. His songs have become part of our cultural DNA. In 1986, a groundbreaking book entitled Bob Dylan, No Direction Home, was written by the renowned New York Times music critic Robert Shelton, whose very first article about Bob Dylan brought him national attention and launched him as a celebrity. The book is uniquely insightful because it's much more than a biography. It's an eyewitness account because Mr. Shelton was a close friend of Bob Dylan's and he was there for all of the pivotal events in Dylan's career in the first half of his life. This book comes as close as any book can to finding the essence of the real Bob Dylan and pierces through all the myths about this elusive artist. Mr. Shelton not only conducted an extensive and profound interview with Bob Dylan, he is the only person ever to have interviewed Dylan's parents. Sadly, Mr. Shelton passed away in 1995, but in 2011, a much more complete version of the book was published, which included many parts that were left out of the original edition. And now a brand new edition is being released thanks to our guest. She is a renowned journalist, broadcaster, and author whose work has been featured in the most prestigious publications around the world. She's a contributing editor to theartsdesk.com. She's a contributor to the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians. She was a founding trustee of the Desmond Elliott Prize for First Novels. She served as editor of the Business Weekly Publishing News. She was the founding editor of Book Brunch, the online bulletin and website for the publishing industry. She has lectured at numerous universities. And as a broadcaster, she has interviewed everyone from Presidents Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton to Leonard Cohen, Judy Collins, Janice Ian, Andre Privin, Vanessa Redgrave, and Joan Baez. In fact, several years ago, she wrote a highly compelling biography of Joan Baez entitled Joan Baez, The Last Leaf. In 2018, she founded The Village Trip, a celebration of arts and activism in Greenwich Village and the East Village in downtown Manhattan. And she currently serves as joint artistic director of that event. But today, she's here to talk about the brand new edition of Bob Dylan, no Direction Home. I'm delighted to welcome Elizabeth Thompson to our show. Liz, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> How did you first get involved with Robert Shelton and this book? My obsession with, with what I came to know is that the New York folk revival had begun in the late 60s when I was scarcely into my teens. And the, the Dylan obsession and the Byers obsession with which it had started grew. And in 78, I was a student and Dylan came to, to Britain for the first time since the Isle of Wight Festival in 1969. And he did a series of concerts and I was desperate to get tickets. There were long queues and I did get tickets and the concert was fabulous. And there was a big outdoor concert following those Earl's Court concerts at Blackbush. And then the following year, there was a convention called Bob Dylan Revisited 1979 and flush with this, the incredible memories of seeing Dylan who'd just been you know, there's 78 concerts, if people remember them, I'm sure they were magnificent. So I went, I booked to go, and there were very few women there at all, a couple, couple of women there as other halves, but no one there in their own right. And it wasn't a particularly wonderful conference. And right in the last couple of hours in the bar at the Piccadilly Hotel in Manchester, someone had said to me, have you met Robert Shelton? You know, so I said, no, I didn't know he lived here. You know, he does. And just at that moment, he walked in kind of, behind his shades, trying to look cool, you know. And we got chatting and he was, wow, there's this, you know, young woman who's <laughs> music graduate, which I was just graduated. So, you know, we got chatting and then we met in London. And uh, I asked quite early on, you know, what's happened to your book, you, you know, which had been talked about for years, of course. And he said sort of grandly, well, it's with my publisher. 
So I thought it was a bit impertinent to ask. And then about six months later, he was still kind of angsting about it. And I said, well, what's happened? Did you hear from your publisher? So he said, no, not a word. Anyway, so I said, well, you have to find out, did it arrive? Those were the days when you put stuff in the actual mail, remember? Anyway, the publisher didn't like the book. And it took another six years before it was published in that 1986 edition, which Bob always called Abridged Over Troubled Waters, which was a very Shelton sort of pun. And he always wished to revisit it because the problem had been that the book was very late. And in order to bring it up to date, he had to add this rather thin coda when he wasn't present in New York because he actually had been in the UK since 1969. So he added the thin coda and in order to accommodate this into a book of reasonable size. The early stuff when he'd been very present in the village, which was the really crucial material that brought D not just Dylan to life, but the whole Greenwich Village scene and also to an extent Woodstock, the pre-festival years, that is to say, came to life in the book and it had all been cut. So you didn't get the, that sense of, you know, Dylan's immediacy and the kind of excitement of those years when there was music cafe, music in the cafes at night, revolution in the air, you know. So he intended to revisit it and then he died quite suddenly in 1995, December 95 of a stroke. And the book sat. And it had come out at a point when Dylan's career in the late 80s was, was quite a low ebb, hearts of fire and all that. So it didn't, you know, it had some nice reviews, but didn't garner the attention. So he died a disappointed man. And the book was flawed, but all books are flawed. But anyway, Dylan was about to be 70. And with his family's permission, Shelton's family's permission, I decided that I would do a sort of director's cut. Not quite the right word for this, because he's obviously not a director in that sense. Anyway, so I revisited the actual manuscript, which was a carbon copy, remember those? And I kind of added huge chunks of it back in. I cut stuff, stuff about the Dylan imitators like Patti Smith, because she was already famous. I cut stuff about the bootlegs, because that was all a done deal. And I put back two, principally two really big sections about Greenwich Village and about and the 1966 airplane interview with Dylan, which are the two key bits of the book. So I, am in a sense, had my friendship with Dylan. And it was a friendship. It was a difficult friendship. He wasn't an easy man. But I did help him to get the book out the first time when I did the photo research and said the book was a bit sexist. He needed to cut back on the criticism of Susie and Joan Myers and so on. And, you know, it exists today because I pushed to keep it going, first of all, in that quarter of a million word edition from 2011, and then in, in this edition here, which is out more or less. So this is a slightly shorter narrative edition, which has all the kind of key background information, but doesn't have quite as much pointiest detail with interviews from all the people. So Shelton and I were friends for the last 15 years of 15, 16 years of his life. The sadness is, I think, that he... He was the witness to an extraordinary time in the, in the village. He was the New York Times critic reporting really for the nation when the Times was in those analog days again, a national newspaper basically. And he was reporting from tiny cafes and clubs a few hundred yards from where I'm now sitting, which is you know just off Washington Square. So I hope he'd be pleased by the fact that his book has had new life and there have been lots of others since. But as you said in your introduction, Robert Shelton was really the only person to get close to the family and to kind of talk to Dylan and certainly to his parents at great length. So he was, as a friend, he was quite difficult, I have to say. Well, he was extremely disappointed with the first edition of the book because the editors had cut so much out. I know your 2011 edition restored those portions from the original manuscript, What's different and new in this latest edition? So the 2011 put back huge chunks of first-hand interviews. So people like Dave Van Roll, Tony Glover, all those in great detail. So Dylan, you know, so Shelton would discuss an event and then you'd hear about it from different angles. So it was, it was really, really detailed. And it was in the end, a quarter of a million words of quite small type. So the new edition sort of cuts back on the endless, you know, this or that angle, that angle, this angle. So it's it's more of so you hear crucial you have crucial input from all the key players, but not from every angle. So it's more of a narrative biography. It's easier to read. I mean, it's aimed obviously at people who are who are very interested in in Dylan and will buy everything. But it's also aimed at the kind of younger audience who came to Dylan. I suppose in the late 
late 20th century, early this century, and also crucially foreign readers, because a quarter of a million word book is very expensive to translate. So it's a much easier read. It's got some very nice photos in it, which chronicle the time. So it's an easier, I hate the phrase coffee table book, but it is a large format book, but it's it's designed to be a much more approachable volume for people who don't want every single last word on the period of Dylan from 1941 to basically 78, where the book ends. What was the biggest challenge of producing this edition? Well, this, the new edition, cutting it, I mean, I had to cut over 100,000 words. And I started to cut it in New York just before COVID. And it's, you know, 100,000 wasn't quite 50%, but it was a very big cut. And I'd cut and edited lots of things before, but it was tricky. But in fact, once, you know, you know what it's like, once you worry about starting something, and then when you start, Actually, it's okay. And I could see as I reread the 2011 book, boy, this is detailed, you know, boom, need a bit less stuff here. So in fact, it, once I got going on it, it was quite easy to cut. There were a few things where I had to get to the second, third, fourth pass and think, don't want to lose that bit. It's really interesting. But, you know, you've got to, that's what editors do. But I tried to do it. You know, the, the problem with the original editor in the 80s had been that they wanted basically a kiss and tell. And Shelton's view all along, which, you know, from the first time I, I met him was very clear. He wanted to present Dylan as sort of, or he saw Dylan and wanted to present him as a sort of Picasso figure or George Bernard Shaw, you know, this seminal creative figure, creative and cultural, who'd had these various sort of periods in his life, if you like, you know. You know, Picasso had his blue period and this, this, the other. Dylan, obviously, the protest, acoustic, electric, and so on. Who was going to be... In Dylan, so he wanted to present Dylan not as, you know, someone who was a, a showbiz figure, but someone whose work we would revere and generations down the line would revere as someone who made a significant contribution to our music and arts in general. And, of course, you know, not so many years ago, Dylan was awarded the Nobel Prize, and you can argue whether... Leonard Cohen would have been more deserving, perhaps, you know, but Dylan, obviously, those great 60s songs and some of the later albums, not all of them, are incredibly important. And they are part of our cultural DNA, as you said in your introduction. And look how many of his phrases have gone into the sort of lingua franca, if you like, you know, the whole wide world is watching. The times have changed. You will see used as a parody. So he is a, a crucial figure. And you can argue about all the stuff he's done in the last 10 years, you know, the art, with the fake signatures, lots of not terribly good albums, but those 60s into the 70s and sporadically after, you know, Oh Mercy, great later album. He is really, he's a really important figure and he did change the metabolism of popular music, as Shelton said. Do you think Robert Shelton's friendship with Bob Dylan affected his objectivity as a music critic when he reviewed Bob Dylan's work? I mean, obviously, at the outset, you know, in 61, 62, when he was first writing about him, he didn't certainly in 61, when he wrote the review of Gerdes that you mentioned, they didn't really know each other well. They crossed paths in the village, which is a very small area. So they kind of knew each other as, you know, you run into your neighbours. But he did come to know him well. And obviously, Dylan trusted him. So, yes, to an extent. And he used to say to me when he was battling, he was a ferocious writer of late night letters, which he should never have posted, but did. You know, he, he'd get the, the comments from his editor and he said at one time, I don't want to sell off the relics of a friend. And he did feel very strongly and honorably in many ways that he didn't want to, you know, I'm not gonna write about the divorce and who slapped whom. I mean, whether anyone slapped anyone, I don't know. But, you know, he wasn't interested in detailing Dylan's tussles with drugs, whatever, or. He said, it's all there if you can break the code. And that is true. But there are a lot of people who would say that it was a cop out not to be a bit more specific. But of course, now we're in an entirely different age since the 80s of biography, I suppose, where everyone kiss, kisses and tells. That wasn't Shelton's style. So, yes, I mean, you could say he, he treasured the friendship, honoured the friendship. But do we need to, you know, we know more than we need to know about every celebrity now. Do we really need to know the details of everyone's? It's, you know, obviously personal lives are interesting. What's in the public interest is not necessarily what interests the public most. But, 
you know, I think you have to reflect the personal life insofar as it impacts on on the on the work life and the creative life. And you know, not most of us would not want every aspect of our lives, however unimpeachable, put into the public domain. You know, that's fair enough, I think. I think so too. One thing I learned from the book that a lot of people may not know is that Robert Shelton, who was a New York Times music critic, actually wrote the liner notes for Bob Dylan's first album under the pseudonym of Stacey Williams, That's right. which is astonishing because music critics were not supposed to be involved in the production of any records that they might later have to review. What do you think of that? Uh, you did, and I think a lot of people didn't know that till quite later on. He was unveiled. I remember in the in a music paper in the seventies when Scaduto's biography came out, you know, because he as Stacey Williams, he revived the pseudonym to review St- Scaduto, and then someone unveiled him. I don't know whether that was the first time, but obviously it was extra. I don't think he was the only person to do it, but I imagine it in that period had the New York Times known about it, you know, the punishment could have been quite severe, perhaps the, the loss of job, and uh, you know now nowadays, of course, we're much more. Unfortunately, we've become used to those sort of rather ghastly compromises and, you know, much more porous boundaries. But it was, it was, you know, it was not, it was forbidden, basically. Another thing I learned from the book is that Peter, Paul and Mary at one time owned a piece of Bob Dylan. Isn't that fascinating that they were such astute business people? Well, I think that's down to uh, Albert Grossman, who was Dylan's manager and, of course, Peter, Paul and Mary's manager. And he, you know, he was he was around in the, you know, he he owned the Gate of Horn in Chicago, where of course the Debtor sang and where Byers made a 1959 debut, and then he came into the village because he saw the and he produced the first Newport Folk Festival with George Vine, of course, in 1959. So he came into the village because he saw the possibilities of the folk revival, and he put together Peter Paul and Mary. They had to find the Mary figure, and and then Paul Noel Paul Stuckey. Dave Van Ronk was asked if he'd like to take the Noel role. He didn't want it. So the combination of putting, you know, Peter Paul and Mary was a confected trio, very successful. And people said they were too commercial, but I mean, many of their carefully wrought harmonies. But Grossman's real skill was to deal with Dylan's song publishing and then get Peter Paul and Mary and whoever else to record the songs. And of course, in 1963, Peter Paul and Mary's version of Blowing in the Wind was a massive hit. I think from memory, the figure was about 320,000 copies in a very few weeks. And that meant that Dylan went to his first Newport Folk Festival that July 1963, which is the moment he's crowned, you know, and Byers comes out and sings duets with him. And then the whole company at the end joins for Blowing in the Wind and We Shall Overcome. So that was incredibly astute because it meant that, you know, <laughs> I suppose he was double dipping, you'd say, another thing that's not very encouraged in business. But Peter Paul and Mary, you know, recorded a huge number of Dylan songs. And many Dylan people would say it's saccharine. And, but they did wonderful things with them. And they put them into, you know, they got them into the charts, selling, and not just for that record, they sold, you know, Times They Are Changing, there are lots of Dylan covers that sound very different when performed by them. But they they made him very successful and they made him rich pretty early on. You know, I mean, Dylan's early record sales were not extraordinary. And Peter, Paul and Mary were, you know, a fairly, fairly quick hit. Has Bob Dylan ever said what he thinks of the book? He, in 86, when it came out, he was in London filming that not very distinguished film, Hearts of Fire, and Shelton got summoned to his... Uh, trailer at some point to to see him and I met Bob Shelton just afterwards and he felt that the meeting had been a sort of a benediction is perhaps not quite the right word but it was sort of an approval they hadn't seen each other for a long time and when I began the 2011 you know, rest- restoration let's call it a restoration I did actually get in touch with Dylan's management and in fact I went in and met with Jeff Rosen Um, We talked about it a bit and they put no impediments in the way, which I think is a sort of way of saying we were perfectly happy with it. And actually, after the 2011 edition came out, they did say they were very pleased with that. I know because they sent an email at some stage, which which said that they're not denigrating Shelton's, but saying that the restoration had put back a lot of important material and it did make it a much better 
narrative, which was my intention. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't write anything new for that 2011 edition apart from an introduction. So the, all the narrative stuff was was Shelton's, but it was a much better, excuse me, it was a much better construction because you know you saw the whole arc of his life. Have you ever met Bob Dylan? Once, after Shelton died, I'm um, quite a long time. I was, I wrote about the book business as you alluded to and when his when chronicles came out which i guess was 2003 was it just before dylan was in london playing a series of concerts and his publisher asked me if i'd like to join a small group of people going and i said yes um when the day came um they said have you got some id with you so i said well yes why you know i didn't go to concert anyway so at the end of it we had to race out during the second encore and rendezvous with his road manager around the back of hamilton's uh, hammersmith odeon and I found myself, I was thought I was hallucinating. I found myself on the side of the stage, looking across at Dylan, playing keyboards on like a rolling stone while the kind of drums were packed up and so on. And then we went backstage, the publisher and I, and we chatted for about 15 minutes with Dylan in his dressing room. And it was extraordinary. And he was very, you know, you always worry when you're gonna meet your people you've admired that they're gonna be terribly disappointing. And Dylan by all accounts often is, but he was very gracious. We had to came off stage. We were sort of we had to wait in the sort of huddle back stairs. And then we were told, knocked on the door, he went in, and there was Dylan in his stage clothes, and there was a there was his hat on the on the dressing room table and sort of half-eaten pizza. And we introduced ourselves and I said, Oh, hello, I'm a friend of Robert Bob Shelton, you know, and he said, Oh, nice guy, you know, and so on. And then I asked him how he sort of started to write chronicles, and he said, which the publisher didn't ask because they were more in it than I was, I think. So and he said he started to write chronicles by writing some sleeve notes and then he wrote about the neighbourhood and then, you know, so on. So we were there for about 15 minutes and he was, he was very gracious and it did feel extraordinary to have met him after all these years, you know. I'm sure that's the only time I'll meet him, but it was, it's very nice to have been able to, to meet him and shake his hand. I'm so glad you got that opportunity. Liz, I want to read you what Robert Shelton wrote when he was trying to describe Bob Dylan. He said, Bob is a popular hero who denied his own heroism, a rebel who so eloquently challenged his culture that he helped build a counterculture and who then turned against the excesses of what he helped create. He was a myth maker, a myth taker, and a myth breaker. My question to you, Liz, is this. Do you think with all the facets of Dylan's personality that anyone can truly encapsulate the essence of who this man is? Between hard covers, you mean? Yeah. No, I think it's very difficult. And does any biography of anyone really? I mean, who would you who would we name if we had to, you know, if you had to think of someone who's really conjured up? I mean, what I you know, one of the things I do a lot nowadays is write publishing obituaries of all the great figures and I always try with those to bring people alive on the page for for the folks who've never known them never met them and I think that's what a that's what a biography of any person living or dead has to you've got to somehow bring them alive so that you do feel you're and not in a horrible intrusive way you know into the bedroom again but you do feel you're part of the scene and you're transported there and that's what I think you know Shelton does in great part especially in, in that that the 60s period when he is very up close and personal and part of the scene you know I think you 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 try and capture the essence and take someone to the time and you hope you know I always hope especially with music books you hope that you start reading the book and then you you listen to the music and that you kind of you know it becomes a real immersive experience and you and you you know you do you know you really get a sense of the time I mean we have I think in general as a, you know, America as a nation, Britain as a nation, younger people, they've got, we've got very little sense of history of anything anymore, um, whether it's, you know, pop cultural history or whether it's our parents' history of being in the war or whatever. So I think it's, and it's really important that we, we know what's gone before, that it's, you know, Taylor Swift does some wonderful things, but, you know, how do we get from the Andrew sisters to Taylor Swift or from, you know, from the Andrew sisters to whatever it was before them, I can't think, you know, I think we need to see the sort of, con, you know, the artistic cultural continuum and need to know where, where these people fit. I mean, I'm sure you read stuff as well. And you kind of, someone writes about some not perhaps not very distinguished singer songwriter today, and they've got no sense of how we got from all that stuff of the 50s that we were fed through the 60s into so I think it is you know we need to know we need to see people in context and appreciate them in context we really 
you know, really understand where we've come from and where we're going, hopefully. Robert Shelton said in the book that Bob Dylan did not like to be called a poet. Do you know why? I mean, it's hard to, you know, he, he, he accepted a Nobel Prize and, and he did at various points say he wanted it. He was a poet. He was the poet of the jukebox. I mean, who knows? He's a very mercurial figure. What does he call himself now? Is he an artist? Just a song and dance man still, as he famously said in in the mid-60s. You know, he paints, he does ironwork. At some point soon, I imagine he will step down from the, from the stage. What will he call himself then? I mean, he's done all kinds of things. And all these... You know, all these art forms of the same come from the same creative impulse. I mean, look at Joan Baez, for example, who's also who's has retired from the stage, apart from the odd appearance. You know, she's writing poetry, she's painting. I mean, she's painted for a long, long time. You know, she's writing poetry. Judy Collins also writes poetry and has done bits of art. You know, everyone, people who are genuinely creative, I think, do lots of things at various stages in their lives. So is he a poet? Well, I mean, history will have to judge. I mean, I think in the 80s and 90s, there was a great discussion in the UK, and I think here as well, is Keats better than Dylan? Is, you know, can we evaluate him along with Keats? You know, is he all this kind of nonsense? And Christopher, Professor Christopher Ricks, who was by then at Harvard, of course, you know, who's always compared Dylan to Shakespeare. I mean, that stuff is nonsense in a way. You know, you have to judge stuff as it is. And Dylan's great, we had a set out discussion last night at the Café Noir talking about Dylan's, his paintings and his poetry. And, you know, when you listen to those great 60s songs again, and Dylan doesn't know where, he's always said, I don't know where those songs came from. They are, things like Chimes of Freedom, they are just astonishing, really astonishing. Well, in 1964, Bob Dylan wrote, do not create anything. It will be misinterpreted. It will not change, and it will follow you the rest of your life. Well, that's all true, I guess. But isn't it amazing that he didn't seem to realize that what he created didn't need to change because his music and his lyrics are timeless? I suppose it's very hard, you know, when in the moment to know what you're, you know, are you going to last? I mean, the Beatles didn't think they were going to last more than five minutes. It's very, you know, you can't judge your own stuff. And he's been such a contrarian throughout his whole life. You know, you never really know whether you can believe what he's saying or he's not. I mean, I'm sure at some level... You know, he came to New York really determined to make it, thinking he could make it. You know, it's it's an extraordinary thing to have done for anyone to do, really, when you think about it. So he must have believed himself. So did he think his art would last? Probably. But, you know, that's just to say, you know, I knew I would have a profound effect on generations. That's a bit arrogant. So you have to kind of pretend it's, wow, little me with my art, you know. Well, the thing about Bob Dylan that's always amazed me is that he was never a great singer. In fact, Robert Shelton himself described Dylan's voice as pinched, rusty, gravelly, constricted, and a voice that seemed to be fighting its way out of his throat like a captive breaking out of jail. What do you think of Dylan as a singer, Liz? He's not a great singer. And that's, I mean, that's, Shelton was very good at describing voices. Uh, that's a great description. And I remember, you know, I spent my very early teens listening to Joan Byers all the time and Judy Collins. And my parents loved that. And when and then when Dylan came on, they were, as lots of parents, ugh. But, it, you know, his voice, you know, it's not a beautiful voice. I mean, there was the Nashville skyline and the self-portrait voice, which was rather more, you know, listenable and mellifluous. But it's very suited to his own songs. I mean, I do not want to hear him on the American songbook. You know, I love the great American songbook, but I actually, I don't want to hear Dylan singing. And I certainly don't want to hear him singing Christmas carols, although I know people love that. But I think when you, when it comes to Dylan singing his own stuff, I mean, it is an amazing voice. I mean, it's it's never really in tune. You know, when you hear those, the Dylan Byers duets with Byers desperately try to sort of follow his lips and see what's happening. You know, their voices don't really go together somehow, and yet they're incredibly compelling duets, partly because two legends. But it's it's not a it's not a beautiful voice, and certainly now, for a long time, really, it's just a kind of monotone in concert. Well, I remember hearing Bob Dylan say once that he doesn't worry about his voice because he has absolutely no interest in being an entertainer. He wants to be a speaker of truth. That really says it all, doesn't it? It does. Is he a speaker of truth? You know, sometimes, sometimes. But, you know, he said if he, but if he wanted to be a song and dance man, which he said at a, the San Francisco press conference, I think then he is an entertainer. We all want to do different things on different days and wear lots of hats, I suppose. 
Do you feel that Bob Dylan essentially invented the genre of music known as folk rock? Did that come from him? Yes, I think largely because obviously, I mean, obviously the birds and so on took his songs and, and added a beat in the 60s. I mean, they weren't the only people, but they did make great success of things like Mr. Tambourine Man. He certainly, you know, the singer songwriter genre, if you like, I think that really he does, he has to take credit from that because, you know, when the, you know, he came into New York, you know, the, the Beatles invasion, you know, sort of ended the folk rock movement or the, the folk movement for a while if you like we then had folk then it led to folk rock of course but it you know if you think about it until the Beatles wrote their own songs obviously not quite so much early on but they did but you know Tin Pan Alley there was a whole structure that was built around providing often not terribly good songs for people to take into the charts I mean at the Brill building which no longer exists I mean it included Goffin and King and Neil Sedaka, who wrote incredibly enduring songs and went on to have careers of their own, of course, as, as musicians on stage. But I, I certainly think you know, Dylan was crucial in the whole the development of the singer songwriter genre. And then other people, you know, he clearly gave folk a backbeat and, and put it on, on the jukebox. Was he ever really interested in folk music or was it a means to an end? Probably. What do you think Bob Dylan thinks about being famous? It's kind of restricting life, isn't it? He doesn't. I mean, he's. We were talking about this last night with with Professor Sean Willens, who of course ran his family ran the Eight Street Bookshop, and you know, diverse group of people. And you know, we, he is. You know, he's one of the most famous people in the world, and yet, in a way, we still know very little about him because he's managed. You know, when, no one's ever sure how many times he's been married, really, or exactly how many children there are. And a friend of mine lives opposite his son and wife in the village. Nice neighbors, apparently. But you know nothing's discussed. But I mean, it's it's a kind of a weird life because he doesn't have any sense of normal life. And you see pictures of him rushing around with his hoodie on and being hidden. I mean, I think any life of a really famous person must be extremely bizarre. Do you enjoy it? I guess you enjoy what it brings you, maybe, but not necessarily the life. Apart from being on stage, I mean, he's still on the never-ending tour, isn't he? I mean, that that's kind of weird. Well, I mean, he definitely enjoys performing. But when you consider his views about celebrity and the way he has always minimized his own impact as a cultural phenomenon, I have to tell you, I was surprised when he agreed to accept the Kennedy Center honor in 1997. And I was shocked when he agreed to accept the Nobel Prize in 2016. So part of him obviously does like the notoriety and the recognition. Yes, I mean, fame, you know, fame is a very... I mean, I don't have it, so I don't know, but it's seductive, you know, and, and the Kennedy, you know, his career has ebbed and flowed. And it was interesting because we learned in Chronicles, of course, that there was a point where he considered giving up because his career wasn't going well. And then it kind of, there was a resurgence. And, you know, perhaps part of the Ken, accepting the Kennedy Center honor was that, well, you know, discussion with the management, actually, I need to, you know, I need to do something that, puts me back on a certain platform. I mean, obviously he's, he's, he and his management team have assiduously curated, to use the word that's overused these days, his life and career, because all that stuff was sold to Tulsa. They've kept absolutely everything. Uh, interestingly, a lot of the stuff they've acquired is not on show, it's kind of squirreled away. I mean, that's always the case I know, but I think it's, it's kind of, you know, kind of slightly odd rationale. So at some level, he's kept everything, you know, he must have, he must, he and his team must have known that at some stage in his life, you know, all this would matter. And, you know, we've had the, the Seattle, you know, that the Morgan Library thing began on the West Coast of Seattle with some of Shelton stuff, and then it came to New York. And then obviously the Tulsa uh, music, you know, the Woody Guthrie Center emerged in Tulsa and then they bought the, the Dylan archive, which I haven't in fact been to. So his his profile and his, his career and his achievements are curated. I mean, I think it's a shame that, you know, we need, you know, there was Dylan scholarship in the, when Shelton was writing, you know, people doing PhDs and there, I imagine there are still quite a few. And then, there, you know, they opened up the archive to an official biographer who's not done a, a very, in my opinion, and obviously I suppose I have a bias, you know, I think we need, we need people to bring to it real, who come to it, not just as Dylan fans, but come to, come to 
Dylan's work in all its complexity and all the various facets of it as objective, proper critics and not just as fans who seek to, you know, he was, he left, he flew out of Nebraska on this day and he bought a sandwich here. I mean, no one really, none of that matters. It's about, you know, what he created. I mean, the kind of day by day and, you know, the biographers all complaining, that's wrong, you know, he wasn't there then, he was doing X. I mean, you know, you don't want to have massive glaring errors, but what what matters in in biography and history is the kind of arc of history and not the, you know, did he have a sandwich on that day from that store? But we do need serious books about serious subjects, not just kind of showbiz, quick, you know, money fixes. And Dylan is now a source of academic study, which people has been for a long time, but people were very derisive about that in the 60s and 70s. And we need to find the language and the approaches for looking at not just Dylan, but the Beatles and everything else. So we need to find a kind of language and a judgment criterion and not just talk about, how do we talk about the music per se? How do we talk about the lyrics? How do we talk about the fusion? We've got to come to, to some kind of way of talking about popular culture, I sort of hate the phrase really, in a way that's that's meaningful and does set it in context for future generations of study, assuming we all survive and don't get nuked in the near future. Oh, let's hope not. Bob Dylan's first girlfriend is quoted in the book as having said, Bob Dylan's only mistake was getting caught up in the vortex of being the Messiah. What do you make of that comment? Well, it certainly was a lot of, I mean, he clearly didn't like that role, the Messiah role, and who would? I'm sure he never intended, much less imagined that. I mean, he probably, I think he probably imagined fame and probably some fortune. Messiah? Not so much. And of course, you know, he wrote all those incredible songs, which, you know, finger pointing songs, he called them. And then, you know, obviously Baez, who was very politically active and still is very polit politically active. I mean, she admitted that she wanted him to, to come out and be the spokesman. I don't think she ever worked. She didn't use the word Messiah. Other people did. And, you know, that's he was. Apart from anything else, we forget he was incredibly young. He was 21, 22, 23. I mean, they were all young doing this stuff. So who wants to be kind of thrust into that to that role? I mean, it's perhaps it's quite seductive on one level to be the spokesman of a generation, but it's also pretty terrifying. And of course he didn't want that. Who would? And um, you know, people you know, people write about how the motorcycle accident in 1966 nearly killed him. And Shelton always maintained that. I mean, no one really knows how serious the accident itself was. It saved him because he was able to then sort of draw a line, you know, get off the road because he was due to go out and love it, to, to draw a line under what had gone before to save himself from the mayhem and the craziness and have some family life up there in Woodstock and create the basement tapes. And he was able to leave that whole Dylan's Messiah thing behind him. Well, not entirely, but of course, when he returned for the 74 tour, there they were again, and it's always kind of haunted him, but he was able to put his life on pause and have and have a stretch of normal family life for a period of time, which he'd never had. Because who wants, you know, who wants the responsibility of saving everyone? Well, I always found it interesting that in the early days, Bob Dylan was often compared to James Dean, not only because they were both seen as rebels, but because people really thought Bob Dylan would self-destruct like James Dean did. Yeah, Bob has proven to be very resilient, hasn't he? He has, he has, and there's that famous Richard Farina. You know, Richard Farina, of course, did die in a motorcycle accident in '66 by his brother-in-law. There's that famous piece from I've forgotten which magazine, at Mademoiselle, maybe, of, of Dylan at Berkeley, I think, on that tour with Byers, and it's you know, and it that specifically addresses that idea that. Both of them could be dead. You know, you were both cast as rebels. And, you know, see them now. I think he actually says something. See them now because they might be dead tomorrow. And, of course, they both got on into old age, we would say. You know, so there we go. But he was seen as a rebel with a cause. And certainly the, the level, you know, he, that's that was his teenage years. I mean, James Dean was his, you know, in rock and roll. That's what he wanted to be, I think. Now, of course, you're the perfect person to ask this question about Bob Dylan's relationship with Joan Baez. I mean, you wrote the definitive biography of Joan. Why do you think their relationship was so turbulent and ultimately so heartbreaking for her? 
I mean, she probably expected more than, you know, she did want him to, to, to be at the barricades and be a spokesman. I mean, they were two, I mean, again, they were both very young when, you know, you think 62, 63, they were scarcely, as she said, we both had our baby fat. And she was very committed. She came from a very different background, you know, with that Quaker background with pacifism, um, non-violent. She was, she was and remains very committed. Was Dylan committed to any of that ever? Probably not. I mean, they made, and it seemed for a minute, you know, the king, you know, the prince, crown prince, queen of folk, and all the rest of it, you know, it was put together by the by the by the media, by the by the kind of fan magazines at the time. Did I even really want that? I mean, by as I said, we were both lost in our bubbles of ego. We were too young. We both had ego, so it was never it was no never going to last. I mean, the the song she wrote, I mean, she's wrote several songs about you know, Winds of the Old Days, of course, the nineteen seventy four tour where she addresses the idea of him of, of how she and everyone else wanted him to be the messiah and then of course only a couple of years later diamonds and rust which is about their love affair very bittersweet song and then they were both able in their various the documentaries of, of you know of the 90s and well, this century i think it's hard to remember where we are isn't it to say good things about each other and dylan of course said how important his her voice had been to him. And he talked about the siren call. And, uh, you know, they were never, I'd have walked a million miles to see them together in Rolling Thunder. I would have just loved that. And there is something magical about watching them, especially actually that mid 70s Rolling Thunder tour where there's very tight mic shots, you know, when you see them together doing Never Let Me Go. Very magical about seeing them together, but it was never, it was probably never destined to work. But extraordinary and it's you know I you know I'd so wish I'd seen them and they obviously do continue to mean a lot to each other in so far as one could tell Baez has been very open about it and she was clearly she was clearly very hurt by what happened I and mean, it was a brutal leave taking in England in 1965 on that tour captured and don't look back and it took her quite a long time to recover but she's you know she said when she listened to Rough and Rowdy Ways, you know, the last album, while she was painting, she came to somehow it all, all the kind of anxiety and misery of those years drained away. And she just came to appreciate him for what he was. It'll be very interesting to see down the line how their people look at their two, their lives together, that brief period, which was quite short, really, but sort of begun here in what was the Hotel Earl. Well, I'll never forgive him for breaking her heart. I can tell you that. Do you yeah, no, any- I know. It's, I think it's, it's well, you know, it's always horrible, isn't it? Whenever your heart's broken. And it was a very public heartbreak. Do you have any thoughts about the memoir that Bob Dylan released in 2005? It was called Chronicles, Volume 1. Yeah, I mean, did he actually write? I mean, people claim he wrote it. Some people claim he didn't write it. But it was a very effective, picaresque memoir. I mean, a much better memoir of the time is Susie Rosalo's Freewheeling Time, I think, which does paint those stories of the village. But it's... I think it's, you know, it's an essential read, Chronicles. Will he ever write another volume? I think he was supposed to write three originally, I think was the idea. Probably not, perhaps in old age when he's off the road. But I think it's, you know, you have to, you have to, you know, it's a, it's a trip through the foggy ruins of time, if you like. It's an essential read, not wholly accurate, but perhaps not very accurate. But I mean, part of, you know, another part of his creative self you know writing this memoir that's quite a memoir but not a novel either you know picaresque memoir he's bound for glory i suppose have you had a chance to see the new bob dylan movie called a complete unknown starring timothy chalamet no i haven't and it's going to be out very soon isn't it i think by christmas i would love to see it. it's been i mean it's been filming around the village they didn't film here at this hotel interestingly they filmed at the chelsea where Dylan, of course, spent quite a lot of time and wrote some songs. I can't wait to see it. And of course, all the Dylan fans will be out there, you know, that's wrong, that's not correct. You know, it'll be fascinating to see it. The the kind of extracts online, the short pieces of Chalamet performing, look very good, just wandering around looking cool in his shades and leather jacket. And the bit I saw of Baez and Dylan together, you know, Monica, um, forgotten her second name, together, that was quite clever because they had them duet on a song that they never performed together, I think, Girl of the North Country, because otherwise you'd have, you know, it's quite easy to do Dylan's voice, not so easy to do Joan's voice. Well, that's for sure. Well, Liz, I have only one more question for you, and it's this. Do you have a favourite Bob Dylan song? 
do I have a favourite Bob Dylan song? Yeah, that varies from day to day, doesn't it? I've loved Desolation Row and Chimes of Freedom and um, Simple Twist of Fate from Blood on the Tracks. That's three songs, too many. Oh, that's okay, because I can't decide. I have two favorites, Blowing in the Wind and To Make You Feel My Love, which I think was beautifully covered by Adele. Yes, absolutely. And, and of course, you know, the, the, you know, there are lots of songs that have been, you know, the later songs have been much less covered by other artists. But there are, there are some, and Ring Them Bells from Oh Mercy, I think is a wonderful song too. So, you know, I suppose it's easy, you know, that question is more easily answered if you had to pick one from each of Dylan's periods. It's very hard to, to pick a, to pick one song. And I remember when I first listened to, you know, when I was first listening to Dylan, having gone through Baez first of all, when I was 11, 12, 13 in the early seventies and listening to Desolation Row and Chimes of Freedom and thinking, that me, I, you know, I just don't understand it being, but you know, of course you can't understand it 11 years old. You know? I think it's amazing that you wanted to try. You are an old soul, Elizabeth Thompson. Well, I, 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 I mean, I cannot, I mean, here I am. I've spent a fortnight, this is the sixth year of my festival here, which is midway through. And I can't really explain what's caused me to, to sort of dribble so much money into it. I don't have kids and I don't play golf, so that's okay. But I'm still, this is an obsession that's lasted for 50 odd years, more than 50 years actually, because I'm getting old now, 55 years probably. And I can't quite, ex- I mean, I would like to explain why I'm so obsessed with this, music in this era but it still makes me cry it still resonates with me and it still thrills me more than anything else but I was you know when I was first obsessed with this my classmates were all screaming for David Cassidy and Donny Osmond and I kind of thought you know years later I sat opposite Donny Osmond at dinner for his memoirs and I kind of thought well if my classmates could see me now they'd tear my eyes out (laughs) but he had nice teeth but what else can you say you know none of that's none of that's a lasting but you know this this music that we've talked about in this era you know it, it has lasted and it will last and it means something and it's important to me and I think it's important to you and I think in you know it goes in and out of fashion a bit but I think it will still mean something in 50 and 100 years time and we have to we have to kind of cherish what is valuable and not lose it in all the horrible showbiz crap we have to really you know look at it and it it tells a lot about the times that you and I didn't quite live in when we did but we were too young you know it's a very important it's a hugely important part of our cultural history and we can see how much the Chalamet film distorts it all but it'll be fun to see it and it will make however good or bad the film is it will make take people back to this period and make them think about it and send them back to the music and send them back to the books and that's what matters listening to the music. Well, I think the timing of the book is wonderful because the movie's coming out. It will definitely create curiosity about him among younger listeners. Liz, it's been such a pleasure meeting you and having this opportunity to talk with you about this book. It really is a must read for every Bob Dylan fan. Thank you. I think you have not only participated in honoring Bob Dylan's legacy, but you've also, together with Robert Shelton, extended and improved the historical record about this incredibly gifted artist. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you. I was very, very privileged to be able to join you. Thank you very much indeed. Our guest has been Elizabeth Thompson, editor of the brand new edition of Bob Dylan, No Direction Home, which is now available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. For more information about Elizabeth Thompson, please visit her official website, LizThompson.co.uk. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my managers, Rick Marcelli and Robin Bragg Marcelli at the Marcelli Company in Hollywood, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.